Hey, what's up, and welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is part one of our Santa Cruz training camps question and answer section. So without further ado, let's get right into it. So uh, your question is, if you have cramps, uh, leg cramps specifically, in the middle of night, what should you do about them? What caused them? Yes. What is thoughts? <laughs> um, so we should differentiate between certain pathologies like restless leg syndrome and then actual like muscular cramps. Restless leg syndrome can be caused by a bunch of different things, including like iron deficiency, you have a thyroid, you could have um, be on certain medications that causes RLS. That's a different thing. Usually those things don't feel like cramps, although some people can report similar symptoms. For actual like cramps, uh, usually those are secondary to fatigue. Not necessarily an electrolyte imbalance, unless you have another medical problem that is causing a severe change in your electrolyte status. So what I mean is taking potassium or sodium or electrolyte pills or supplements would not cure your cramps outside of a placebo mediated mechanism. So if you're having cramps, the most likely cause is that your training fatigue has acutely, or in a short period of time, increased above what you can currently tolerate, which is why now you have cramps. So what do you do about that? You adjust training as needed, um, which may be decreasing the average intensity that you're training at, altering the frequency which you're training at. If you are training in a situation where it's very hot inside of a gym, the environmental stress makes the fatigue of that training session go up independently of what you were doing sets, rep, intensity-wise. Does that make sense? Yep. So people are like, oh, it's hot, it must be dehydrated. It's like, well, no, it being hotter just made it more fatiguing. Or like sniffing smelling salts before every rep to get hyped up makes that training stress more stressful, even if the sets, reps, and weights are the same. So what would I do about it? I would just adjust training. Okay. Awesome. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think we get questions a lot about cramps and tremors and shaking and all kinds of you know, physical symptoms like that. And uh, I often point, I, most people here are probably at, least at this point familiar with the, the painscience.com website that I send people to a lot for pain related things. Yeah, that's how He has an article on cramp, I think it's titled like cramps, twitches, and tremors or something like that. And he talks about uh, similar stuff, how it's more often mediated by fatigue, less often related to electrolytes. You know, if you had, uh, I think the main one that I could think of would be like a parathyroid disorder and you had like, you know, yeah. severely low calcium, you'd be getting cramping all over the place and it wouldn't just be in the middle of the night. So, you know, it's unlikely that it's related to, you know, that your, your sodium's getting too low or potassium's getting too low or something like that. So, yeah, I would agree that it's probably primarily fatigue mediated in most people. Yeah, even though you'll see all over the internet people talk about, oh, I took magnesium and my cramps went away or something like that. Yeah, it's just, well, the, the average thing is that your cramps are going to stop. Anyway, yeah. that's just the natural history yeah. of cramps right. in general. And then uh, the last interesting thing I'll say, and then we'll just move right along, like I never said it, is that uh, nearly all folks will become low in sodium after training okay. to no significant effect. It just occurs because you're losing sweat. Um, you'll, it, we call this uh, uh, hyponatremia, so you're low in salt, and it, it's not doesn't require you going to the hospital and getting, you know, sodium replenishment or being monitored. Okay. But then normal physiological response to strenuous exercise is that your sodium levels drop a little bit. Um, there's been some discussion in uh, people who are responsible for making recommendations about what do you do with athletes as far as sodium intake goes. And that's one of the reasons why they recommend taking sodium pre and post workout. So the current American College of Sports Medicine or ACSM guidelines for sodium intake for athletes without high blood pressure is that is to increase sodium intake by 500 milligrams in the meal before a workout and the meal after workout. The idea that you're replenishing your sodium, even though that has not been shown to change, you're still going to be hyponatremic after you work out anyway. Okay. Just it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Let's gloss over all the potential pathologies after worse. <laughs> all right. The question is, if you are super sore and it is a non-training day, what should you do to treat or manage your soreness? Should you foam roll, uh, self-myofascial release, or other sort of interventions? Austin? So I think before I address that 
question. The, the, the first question I ask is, why are you getting so sore? Because if you're training intelligent with like, you know, intelligent programming towards a particular training goal, so, you know, you think about what are the things that contribute to soreness? Oftentimes it's high volumes of eccentric, heavy, or novel exercises, right? So it's like when you've tried, when you do a movement that you haven't done in a really long time for a whole bunch of reps, that's when you get sore, right? But if you do that again two days later, you get less sore. You do that again two days later, you don't get sore anymore. So if you're routinely getting sore after every training session, something is off with your programming probably, right? Yeah. So we don't get sore hardly ever, unless we've just like peaked for a meet, we've dropped our training volume a ton, you know, we've gone to compete, and then we come back the next week and we get back into things like full throttle. We do a bunch of work, we do a bunch of movements we haven't done before, then we're sore for a few days and then it stops by the next week. So I would ask like, why are you sore? Perhaps your programming needs to be adjusted so that you're not getting sore all the time and then that's not even an issue. Yeah, there's and actually- you can take the next part of it. Oh, well, <laughs> so just as a, to add on, there's actually some evidence suggesting that if you're getting very, very sore routinely, that that is compromising your muscle repair, remodeling, and overall hypertrophy response to the training, which is a mechanism of you adapting to the training because it's overwhelming your sort of uh, uh, repair processes that you currently have, which is why you're sore, because you can't repair fast enough to not be sore. And so by overwhelming the, their capabilities, you actually don't get a good muscle growth response from training. So I, the ideal program would be one that doesn't produce soreness routinely. You might have it initially, but then you don't. Yeah, well, that's what I, the repeated bad effect does. Yeah, you. basically, unless the training has continued to overload someone so much so that they never they never get to adapt to it. In which case, you would say, well, that's just stupid training. It's not the best type of training. Yeah. Um, as far as interventions that can alter the like natural history of being sore, so like make it go away faster, there are strong placebo. Well, there are some placebo effects for virtually every intervention. So if you think that a massage, if your belief system is such that a massage is going to make you feel better, you're likely to feel better after the massage. Plus another human's touching you, you know, let's not, I mean, you had to pay for it, but whatever, it's fine. <laughs> if, you, if you have a belief system that, going, that foam rolling is going to make you feel better, you'll likely report feeling better afterwards. Um, and that's your individual experience. No one can take that away from you. No one can say, well, that's not true. You experienced it and that's it. But when you look at data that have been collected from multiple different studies. On average, foam rolling doesn't decrease soreness, doesn't improve performance on repeated uh, uh, tests. Like, you want to do a vertical jump the day after training heavy. Does foam rolling make, can you jump higher? No. Um, things like massage tend to decrease uh, blood flow to the level of the muscle, because it increases blood flow to the level of the skin, because that's what you're touching. Um, that's been studied. Things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy chambers. People are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get so much oxygen. The problem is, it, not only do they not work, but you have a risk of like blowing yourself up. So, <laughs> well, oxygen, yeah, turns out flammable, yeah, uh, as it were. Yeah, so high risk, like potential spontaneous explosion, and like no benefit on training outcomes or repair outcomes. So that doesn't seem like a good, a worthwhile thing. Um, the best thing you can do to alleviate soreness is to become more trained in a progressively overloaded manner that doesn't actually make you sore. Does that, that kind of make sense? Yeah. yeah, so foam rolling, lacrosse ball, Graston, Rolfing, et cetera. Theragun, yeah. jigsaw, massager, <laughs> you know, Hitachi self want, whatever. If none of it's making, well, that's a thing. I think. I don't know. I don't have one. But it, what the thing is, it's just not going to make you less sore outside of a placebo-mediated mechanism, which I'm not saying is worthless. It's just, you could just tell yourself you're not going to be sore and save some money. <laughs> yeah, donate, or donate that money to charity, and then everything's, everything's better. So, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't do anything except for just training. So the question is, how, what is our management of reoccurring sciatic pain? Well, I think you'd have to couch that with a few, a few different things. Like, is re is it really that? Yeah, is yeah. the first question. Yeah, so diagnosis. How is it diagnosed? So is that diagnosis valid? Uh, because you would actually have to have some sort of like EMG related study well, showing so that that's the nerve. So, so people talk about pain or symptoms radiating down the back of their leg all the time, right? If it just radiates down from your butt to like the middle of your hamstring, everybody who is not necessarily trained in this stuff is going to call that sciatica. That is not, in fact, sciatica. 
right? So I'll, I'll put it this way. If it doesn't pass the knee, I have questions, right? Yep. So that's the first thing, is the diagnosis. The next thing is if it is in fact that, there's evidence that all, appro probably approaching two-thirds of, of quote-unquote sciatica, which is in fact confirmed by MRI with like a correlating lesion, like a thing on MRI that you see that matches what you would expect the patient to be feeling, right? So you're a little bit more convinced. Probably approaching two-thirds of that resolves on its own within 12 months and is fine which is a pretty good prognosis. And actually, the paper that I'm quoting that from suggested that the biggest, the mo the, one of the best predictors of the people who were gonna get better within that 12 month period are the people who thought it was going to last the shortest amount of time. Yeah. Not what they saw, not all this other stuff. The people who believed that they were gonna recover the soonest were the people who tended to get better within the year. Pretty interesting, in line with all this other stuff we talk about, right? So if they have recurrence of these symptoms, whether it's due to sciatic or whether it's due to something else, but it's bothering them to the point where they can't live their life, they can't train the way they, you know, that we would recommend they train, for example, then we have to probably find workarounds. The first step is always education. Teach them all this, I would teach them all this pain-related stuff so that they're not feeling the symptom, freaking out, of course, as we always say. Right? They're not catastrophizing, they're not afraid to move because of this pain, stuff like that. So education is step one, and then modification of training is step two. They might need to modify what movements they do. There might be positions that they might be less sensitive to. So for example, somebody's sensitive to setting up with a conventional deadlift, Maybe the tension back there uh, bothers them or getting into that position bothers them or they're afraid to get in that position. Maybe you set them up to rack pull. Maybe you set them up to sumo. Maybe you do something else. So training modification to get them into positions, movement patterns that they can train productively that they are not as sensitive to. Once you find those, you train those, they get more confident, they feel like they're getting better, stuff like that. And in general, their natural history is going to be to improve over time. Now, when, if, if they have a true radiculopathy with motor symptoms, foot drop, for example, right, and you are coaching them, then you need to send them to be evaluated. That's a different scenario. Yeah, that's right. the CYA. I mean, although they're, well, Most of those will get better, too, yeah. but not your decision to make. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they basically need to have a clearance that, oh, this doesn't need immediate, you know, intervention right. surgically, which there's some nuance into, you know, well, I'm just, if there's, even if there's foot drop or what do you would say, red flag signs, but that's not, again, it's not your decision to yeah. make at that point. So your steps would be education, training, modification, if you're coaching somebody Correct. in the absence of those concerning things. That's how I would summarize the answer. There. Yeah, my answer would be, I actually probably wouldn't tra change anything other than selecting movements that the, the patient's not, a, or the person's not afraid of, provided they've been cleared to train or have no red flag yeah. symptoms. Yeah, sciatic pain is tough. If it's, re if it's recurrent, right? Then it becomes a person's identity, and then they're like, this is my life, it's never gonna get better, and then you, you go down a rabbit hole. Yeah, it's tough, and so, you know, people are like, well, you guys approach and just tell people it's not real, it's all in their head, and it's like, I mean, no, it's more complicated than that, but we're giving you an out, right? The odds are this thing's gonna get better one way or another, and in the interim, we're giving you an opportunity to like yeah. not focus on this, not get addicted to pain medications, take charge of your own life, be active, right? And the odds are you're gonna do better than if you take the other option, which is, oh my gosh, I have this work, this terrible back injury, it's you know going to ruin me, I'll never be able to live a full life again, yeah. I need to do the McGill's Big Three, I need to do all this prehab, I need to buy all the TheraBands. That's why I usually ask patients questions like, what are you most worried about? because then they just lay it all out, yeah. right? They tell me everything. And then, um, and then uh, the other question I oftentimes ask is, what do you think is going on? Because they'll also lay it out there, they'll say, oh, you know, my dad had back problems, he had symptoms like this, my brother had these sorts of symptoms, and I saw what happened to them, and maybe they were in a bad state, maybe they got hooked on narcotics, and you know, all these fears that kind of end up priming you to have a certain experience. So those things need to be addressed as well. You just, you just fight them? Yeah. Turns out <laughs> that SP training was good. Yeah. Like, all right. Uh, the question is, what is the most misinterpreted aspect of pain science? Yeah. So uh, I'll say there are two most misinterpreted things. The most misinterpreted one is what he just suggested, that we are telling people that it's just all in their head oh, and, that you can, and that you can think pain away, right? Oh. So, so you can reframe your thinking from a, you know, your, your volitional kind of cognitive standpoint, you can reframe certain things, right? But when you look at, so when they do studies on patients who have issues with pain, persistent pain states, things like that, and they put them in the fMRI machine, look up at all the parts that light up under the MRI, 
Most of them are what we call subcortical areas. Subcortical means underneath the cortex, underneath the outer part of your brain. So like, quote, you can think of it as the subconscious, the parts of your brain that you are not in full control of, right? And so tons of those areas are involved and you don't have full control over those areas. So you can only think yourself so far, right? But if you have this deep, like let's say you have like severe anxiety, right? That's not something that people can just think themselves out of. They need, sometimes need intensive treatment, extensive therapy, all kinds of other things to make those sorts of changes over time. So that's probably the most misinterpreted one is that we're just saying, ah, just think about it less and everything goes away. That might be a strategy we might use to try to you know, have them shift their attention because attention is involved in people's experience of pain. But if it's way more complicated than that and it really frustrates me when people suggest that that is what I'm saying because I have never in my life used those words with a patient. Because especially the patients who have been dealing with the healthcare system for a long time, who, like he said, being a chronic pain patient becomes their identity, that becomes like super offensive and I'm never gonna see them again. They're gonna be out the door. So I don't say that, don't recommend anyone ever say that to, to, to a patient in that situation. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, the biggest misunderstanding of pain science, science, because this is not, I mean, it, I guess it's a part of the science as far as it's been rejected, but that the, there is a mechanical source of the pain. And I think, you know, if you guys are familiar with our, you know, podcasts and Austin's articles and everything about what is the cause of pain, it, then you know already that having a mechanical sort of source is unlikely to be the cause. But in the general public, the thought that you have a herniated disc, that's why you have back pain, or you have a torn meniscus, that's why you have knee pain, or you have a torn labrum or something in your shoulder, and that's the cause of your shoulder pain and dysfunction, it needs to be fixed. How can you fix it? Well, it's surgery, stem cell, PRP, like all these things to do the interventions because it's mechanical. That's, I mean, that's ubiquitous. You, everybody in here could text somebody right now and that, that would be the conversation you would have. So I think fewer people say that be, just at large because they're not even that far to understand. So my yeah. thing is, and, and, and the second secondary point I'll make is that because people think it's mechanical, then they think, well, I need to get imaging because I want to know. I don't want to know. And I don't want you to know either. It doesn't mean I want to keep you in the dark. It just doesn't change what we're going to do. Don't get an MRI on your shoulder unless you're ready to have surgery. Seriously. And Pretty the much the only reason to do and the, and the surgeon's like, I need to get this MRI with the contrast or whatever to know the procedure that I'm going to do because you are a great candidate for surgery. You don't just want to know because that, the statistic is 96%, 96% percent of shoulders in people over the age of 30 years old will have a pathology that's recognized by the radiologist. 96 percent. Wow. To what effect? And I bet you it's a hundred percent in athletes, right? Just, just as a function of their yeah. sport. And on top of that, uh, to, I don't know if we have people in here who've been, to, who've been to our seminar and listened to my pain lecture when I give it, but one of the studies that I cite during it is a study where they took one 60-something or 70-something-year-old lady who had sciatica, and they sent her to, I believe, 11 different MRIs. Yep. Or, or, or they, yeah. Radiologists. Really. And they had a different radiologist read her individual. So she had one MRI. They sent the, the images to 11 different radiologists and had them all read it. There were 49 different reported findings on these. Not one of them appeared in all 11 reports. So there was not a single finding that all 11 radiologists agreed was present. And there were a number that were either caught by some, missed by others, called by some, not called by others, things like that. So not only do you get the MRI without planning to have surgery just to know, but you think about who's interpreting these images on the other end. It's people, right? People. We are all idiots. We are all biased. We all have our cognitive biases. You know, like you're looking at images and you scan and you see something and you latch onto it and you're like, oh, there's, there's the pain generator. One of doctors. my most hated phrases in all of musculoskeletal medicine is the pain generator that we search for on images. That's my right? name. <laughs> <laughs> like college. Yeah. So, so a second layer of problems with the imaging is disagreements in the interpretation because interpretation is up to humans and we don't have AI that can interpret our MRIs and tell us and Watson's because it's coming. more complicated than that. So. Watson's coming. Nah. Nah. <laughs> nah. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So the question was, how do I feel about my appearance on the doctors given that they asked me, like, hot or not. It was very disappointing that I watched it. Yeah, so I didn't know the, uh, I didn't know the format. Oh, hold on, I'm, a, I'm jamming. <laughs> um, 
Ah, that's sick. <laughs> just want to listen to some tunes. I did. Uh, I didn't know what the format was going to be when I got, uh, until I got to LA and talked to the producer. The producer comes in the, I don't even know what the room is called. It's a room that had my name on it, which was cool. Uh, and they were like, hey, Kay, so we're going to ask you um, these fitness trend questions, you know, like altitude training masks and like, you know, uh, swimsuits with chest hair on them and makeup. And I was like, oh, sick. That's awesome. Uh, but I did not expect that. And that was kind of disappointing because it's like we could have had a chance to like, you know, do something a little more powerful, a little more far reaching. However, I did get to wear my shirt in front on the camera, right? And uh, I got to lift some weights, and then uh, the video, the yeah, yeah, and got Paul Horn's gym uh, on national television. So, I mean, our website traffic and everything went way up. So that was a net win. That being said, um, I was bummed, but it's daytime television and whatever. So, I would like to do some more stuff like that in the future. Uh, I just would like to have more control over what I'm doing. Uh, I wrote an article, for instance, for Shape. The, the, the women's fitness magazine, right? Oh yeah, you're not a subscriber. But, uh, um, but I did, and it was on squatting, and like how to do it, how you should program it in, how to get started, or whatever, and it turned into like this thing about, you know, make your butt look great, and then do eight sets of 10 to 12 reps, and you know, all this other stuff, and I was like, I didn't write this, you know? But I didn't have final edit prior to being published, and so when this, the lady who ended up putting her name on it, right? And she's like, oh, would you want to help me on this core article? I'm like, N one, you're wrong. Two, absolutely not. Um, so I think that I, we need to just work a little more and, uh, and get a little more popular. So that way we have some leverage to say we want final edit of whatever goes up. You know? But who thought I would ever be on TV? You know? Your facial expression at the end was perfect. Oh, yeah, the guy goes, oh, yeah, but body weight's okay. And I'm like, hmm? <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> during all those questions. Yeah. During all those questions. Yeah. It was, uh... Oh, it's Dad's here. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that about you. your facial expressions during the questions. Oh, my gosh. So, so what you don't know, the behind-the-scenes thing, it's like 6 a.m., right? And uh, we're in the studio. It's super cold. And there are apparently 200 super excited, like, middle-aged women there, right? <laughs> now, well... Hey, it's my demographic. All right, so look, the, uh, they asked me at the gym the previous day, Paul's gym, they were like, hey, will you take your shirt off and work out? And I was like, nah, I can't do that. Like, you know, I don't want to do that. But little did I know that they got on my Instagram and ripped a bunch of pictures and stuff off that I don't have my shirt off. And so these girls are going crazy, and I'm like beat red behind stage, you know. And this guy's like, calm down, it's going to be fine. And I walk out, and there's a 20-foot high version of myself, no shirt on. I look back, and he's look at the first clip. I look back, and I'm like, ooh, like, that's, that's terrible, you know. The camera zoomed in on my face, and there's like a nipple. I, it's weird. And so um, they were all grossed out when I, they, uh, they asked me the question about the chest hair swimsuits. They were like, what do you think about that? And I was like, well. I have chest hair, they have chest hair, that's probably pretty cool, you know? And they're like, oh, gross. So, yeah, I didn't get any dates after that, but good, good old, I got a bump, got a bump in traffic. That's cool, I guess. Hey, man, your Instagram fame continues to grow. <laughs> uh, what's the deal with hydration? <laughs> Asked in a kind of like, I hear that in like Seinfeld's kind of voice. Yeah, what's the deal with hydration? <laughs> you know, you got all this water inside you, all this water outside you, what are you supposed to do with it? You know? So, and, and, should you just drink if you're thirsty and how do you know and things like that. So I would not put the message out there that if you're thirsty, you're dehydrated, first of all. Well, that's late. It's a late Well, signal. not only is it late, but where does it come from? So, well, it's where does perception of thirst come from? Where does everything come In from? Instagram? Your brain, <laughs> which is confounded by a number of things. So there, there are psychological pathologies where people just drink too much. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Primary polydipsia. You drink your sodium down too low and you end up in an ICU, for example. So you go out and put out the message that, hey, if you're, yeah, if you're thirsty, just drink a ton until you're not thirsty anymore. Well, there are reasons why people might be thirsty and they might, be, they might have per perceive thirst in the absence of dehydration. But it is, for the most part, a fairly, I mean, it's an extremely powerful mechanism been conserved through evolution. When you have really, 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 you know, powerful thirst, thirst drive, I'll say. Thirst drive. Yeah. Not to be used with hip drive. <laughs> Which is a way to like, not die of dehydration. So that so it is a late sign. 
what Jordan was saying. Yeah. Uh, but I just don't really tend to have people worry about it that much. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, same. I mean, so, well, the time you're actually thirsty, if this is actually indicating that you need to take in water, it's too late from a performance standpoint. Um, I'm not saying it that way. I'm saying day to day, like you're out in the heat type of thing. I'm not saying uh, sure. performance. But it is unlikely that you become acutely dehydrated unless there is a significant change in either your environment or your fluid or food intake. So, because day to day you're able to regulate this stuff, right? Um, if you, for instance, or live in a place where it's not humid, it's not warm, and then go uh, suddenly to a very humid, very warm place, you have not adapted yet, acclimated to that climate, and you do run the risk of becoming dehydrated should you not maintain adequate hydration status. How will you know? You won't. You'll be thirsty at some point, and you'll drink, and you're unlikely to be in any danger unless you don't have access to fluids, but the color of your urine is not sensitive enough to tell you, am I dehydrated? The thirst, being thirsty is not sensitive enough to tell you, oh, I gotta, I gotta get on this, this thing. So even the current recommendation for how much water should you drink in a day is just a bunch of old dudes in a room who's like, you know, three to four liters sounds reasonable. Yeah. And then the ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, said, oh, but if you're an athlete, you know, another two liters on top of that's probably fine. It's just made up. All made in up. the same in the same way, dehydration is not a yes or no state. It's not like oh yes, now I'm dehydrated. I'm not dehydrated. It's a spectrum, right? So, and and the good thing is is that we have very sophisticated kidneys that probably for the most part are underappreciated in what they do for us to maintain homeostasis. Yeah. Right. So they regulate everything. So you're not sitting there worrying about uh, what are my blood chloride levels. Your kidneys are taking care of that. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Right? I'm curious. So it's the same kind of thing because fluid and electrolytes, they kind of are, that's what the kidneys do. So in the same sense that your kidneys are regulating sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, all this stuff, they're regulating your fluid intake too. So if you get quote unquote dehydrated, your kidneys try to save you by making less urine, right? Until you're able to get access to water and drink yourself back to normal. So, it, you know, you said it's, you're not even talking about this in the context of performance, which means it matters even less. Yeah. Yeah. Just right? to like, al just to be alive. Yeah. It's got to be. It's unlikely to be a problem until something else changes. Yeah. So we see dehy well, we saw dehydration in the hospital because people can't eat and literally can't drink. Or their own diuretic medicines that yes. are making them pee no matter what they do take in, and their kidneys are like, well, this medicine is kind of running the show right now, right? Yeah. So that's a way to get dehydrated. But if not taking that, or just live your life, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think in an athletic context, uh, it's more nuanced. The, but, you know, as far as, like, how would you try to set somebody up for success in an athletic, you know, performance standpoint when you know that they're going to be exerting themselves strenuously? And the best way to do that is to acclimate yourself to whatever environment and whatever workload that you, you're going to be exposed to before you get there. Yeah. So, like, the CrossFit Games are coming up, right? And so hydrate, dehydration would be a thing that you'd be concerned about if the people hadn't been training like that previously and had lived in a substantially different climate. So... If, if I was living in Europe or some area that's unlike the Midwest in the middle of the summer, I would try to get here early, give my kidneys and my sweat glands a fighting chance <laughs> to acclimate, you know, because there's nothing that you can do short of that to prepare for a week-long challenge that's going to leave, you know, three-quarters of them with rhabdo and, <laughs> and, you know, well, I'm not, I mean, you know. A little hyperbole. Sorry. Right. Given a choice, would you rather train in a warm climate or a cooler climate? Like the full blast AC? I'd rather be warm than cold. I like my Texas garage. You like what? My Texas garage. Yeah. Ugh. God. When it's 110? Dude. What? That's gross. It's fine. <laughs> so the question is, is there, are there any instances or indications where training or programming may be negatively affecting somebody's sleep? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll address the easy one uh, insofar as it it's, uh, has to do with what time of day you're training. Yep. So... Uh, that's obviously a huge thing. So if you're training, you know, if you work, you know, a busy job and, and you have to get home and train late and you're training, you know, 9 to 10 p.m. and you're hopping in bed at 10.30, well, that can obviously mess with your sleep. I've had to do that before, you know, when working hospital shifts or something like that and I just deal with it and train anyway, right? So that's definitely one. It sounds like you're describing a scenario where that's not the case, but more so uh, it sounded like you got towards the end of the old novice program, everything at... RPE 11, 
grinding real hard, and then you notice that your sleep was getting more disturbed. Right. Well, the wrong, so the wrong uh, anal uh, assessment with that is that you're overtrained. In fact, you are undertrained, as evidenced by the fact you're no longer able to make progress after a given stimulus. You need more training, not less, right? The issue is that this is more of a psychogenic sort of uh, a psychogenic cause of you not being able to sleep well. You, they have this high importance placed on this LP. It's going poorly. It, everything's very difficult, and it, it is such a, a part of your self-worth, and, uh, and, and you hold it in high esteem, and you're not doing very well. And so you get like a training-induced depression. And this is, we just literally just read this, that paper suggesting that people uh, um, have a, a this psychological tie to their training and the social learning around that training. And yeah, that can absolutely cause sleep disturbances. I mean, you're not overtrained. There's nothing physiologically that's causing you to like wake up in the middle of the night, but you're, there's a psychological cause there. And so the the worst thing you could do in that situation is train less. The best thing you could do is say, this is no longer working for me as evidenced by the fact that my performance is no longer improving on, at, with this given training program. Let's do something else. That's the correct assessment. So uh, the last thing I'll add, Austin was talking about training before bed, and sometimes that can compromise your sleep. The, it does worsen your sleep. Uh, uh, sleep efficiency, meaning you're in, even if you're in bed for the same amount of time, you'll be sleeping for less. It takes you longer to fall asleep. However, your time into REM sleep gets shorter. So basically, you can go through the same amount of REM cycles uh, within uh, a shorter period of time that you're actually asleep. So does training at night actually mess with your sleep? Well, if you have adequate amount of time to actually spend in bed, maybe not. It just you know, if you have to wake up super early and you're, comp you're cutting hours off your, off your sleep time, that could. But that's not what you're talking about. You ran LP for nine months too long. But I kept making, I was making gains. Uh, with kept... Z's or S's? What? No. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I wasn't, like, I didn't start, like, uh, having issues where I couldn't progress probably until, like, nine months. Right. Well, the, but what I'm saying is the, the intensity is so high, and that is can be psychologically draining if that is part of your social learning and your, your, your expectation, right? What is preached by the program that you're running? He heavy is hard and it's good and you gotta do it and just grind and keep going and look, it's arbitrary, Wait, whatever, it doesn't matter, it's, you know? I, I've said before that I think the only time in my entire training career where I felt burned out from training was at the very end of when I did a regular three-day Texas Method program, when every set was at 10, death grinds, and I would go in dreading the training session, and I would do it, and I would feel like I had just picked your dramatic analogy, right? Been shot or run over or whatever you want to say, right? Wrecked. And, and, but you have to get yourself so Blasted. unbelievably hyped up for these sessions, right? And I just feel like I was dead afterwards. Yep. Yeah. And that's just poor training management, so. Yeah, and if you rate your RPEs very high, or if you assess that your effort subjectively was very, very high, there's psychological consequences for that, and that can manifest in a whole yeah. host of things. So this training-induced depression thing, and I mean, people are like, oh, I was depressed, man. I mean, maybe it's better as a training-induced <laughs> adjustment disorder. Sure. Bless you. Yeah. You know. Well, that makes sense. Well, I'm now, I'm now you're in good hands. Yes, Leo yeah, will take good care of Yeah, you. only easy stuff from here on out. <laughs> the question oh, yeah. is, <laughs> we maintain a low body fat percentage, how do you do it? Yeah, I just weigh myself really frequently so I know where my weight is at and what's going on. And I tend more often than not to eat more similar things on a routine basis than like wacky different things all the time. Um, so you don't, there's no calorie counting, no meal counting? I personally don't. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, but I, I just... So you use the scale to be back Correct. Yeah, that's your accountability. I mean, but that's similar to, like, I mean, the National Weight Loss Registry, that's one of the tactics that we find that successful dieters will weigh themselves very, very frequently, and that's part of their accountability. Uh, I track my macros three days a week. And it's just, like, because I do eat very similar things or very similar style things, they're just more like spot checking, you know? And I'll just kind of, uh, uh, I'll, I'll track, like, almost every other day or every third day, 
just to see, make sure that I'm coming in. And then if I note, it's funny because the feedback that I, I don't actually don't have a scale right now. I've been living in Airbnb for a long time. And so my scale is actually at my brother's house. So I actually haven't weighed myself like daily. I used to do that. But now what I've been doing is I use the old, uh, the belt to check. So the weight belt doesn't change. If your belt feels a little more snug. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then I'm like, then I'll track for a few more days. But my weight has been uh, remarkably stable between, you know, 200 and 205. Um, and I think that's just now my set point my previous set point was 170 to 175 you know and that was at a much lower calorie intake but uh i think austin and i both have the benefit of coming from you know you were underweight previously and now we're maintaining a significantly higher body fat or body weight mm -hmm. and sim same same sort of thing for me um whereas i think that if you're going the other way then the challenges are different you know trying to maintain a calorie deficit, for instance, or, or at least maintenance to not gradually gain weight. If I had my brothers, if I didn't weigh and measure anything, I'd, I'd probably lose weight. Same. I actually do lose weight frequently when I'm not a, paying enough attention to how much I'm taking in. I've never calculated mine. I mean, calorie-wise, uh, I write at 4,600 calories a day. 4,600? Mm -hmm. Wow. Here's an interesting thing. Uh, so, so Is that because you're like super active? Or? It's no. part of it. Well, I do a lot of sitting, which is good for me, because I'm tired. But uh, the you know it's interesting. When I was, I used to compete in the 181 pound weight class, and I would always be like, once I actually started lifting, I was like 186, 187. I'd always have to cut down, and and I would maintain around 2,200 to 2,400 calories a day was like my maintenance calorie level. And whenever I needed to cut for a meet, I was down at 2,100, 2,200, you know. And so people are like, you're like a young male who lifts all this weight. How are you eating so little food? I'm like, well, my body would prefer to be a little heavier. Not much heavier. I'd probably sit around 190, just like my dad, just like my brother, <laughs> all the way the same, you know. But now to maintain 200 or more, four, yeah, 4,600 a day, people always want to know my macros. And I'm like, yeah, when you're eating 700 grams of carbs a day, you know, you feel bad telling people. <laughs> They're like, that's a lot. I'm like, I know. It's a lot of cereal. Which is uh, meat sometimes. What's your carb bill? Yeah, yeah. Well, Leah always tells me I don't eat. She's like, you never eat. And I'm like, well, I just don't want to eat all this in front of you, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> right, right. So. The, so the question is, when discussing hypertrophy, we have said that intensity is of minimal importance or less important than total volume. Can we comment on that? as far as RPE goes to correlate to useful intensities. Right. So I think that when we look at the factors that drive muscular hypertrophy, the, by far the most important of the, like, the training factors uh, is mechanical tension on the muscle. So the total volume of work that you're providing to it I mean, that mechanical tension is what drives the hypertrophy response. The only thing is that if for this mechanical tension to provide the most effectiveness in generating a hypertrophy response, you have to recruit as many motor units as possible in the muscle. So, you know, if you lift a weight, let's say you, you load 40% of 1RM on there, on, on the bar, and you squat it, I mean, it's like a warm-up, right? You've recruited a relatively small proportion of motor units in the muscle, right? So you've not delivered a very potent stimulus for hypertrophy to it. So you need to find a way to recruit more motor units. So the way we do that is by fatiguing the muscle, right? So through fatigue, it has to pull more motor units in to get the same amount of work done. Does that make sense? And so <clears throat> that's what you see as progressive bar speed decline. As you fatigue, you're recruiting more motor units, and then you run out of more motor units to keep recruiting, and bar speed starts dropping off as you fatigue, right? So when you look at the research on hypertrophy, when you take sets close enough to failure, not you don't have to do them to failure, but let's say, I think most of them, most of them suggest that if you compare like to failure and like say three reps shy of failure, so let's say call it a, a seven, for example, that you can get the equivalent hypertrophy response. So if I load 40, per, let's say 35 to 40% of one RM on the bar, which based on the current evidence seems to be where the lower limit is, as low as you can go, where if you take the sets and make them hard enough, you can get the same hypertrophy response as something that's substantially heavier, taken to the same effort level. Does that make sense? Right. 
So that's, that's the idea is that you need to recruit the motor units. So for example, then people will say, what about blood flow restriction, right? So they'll wrap a tourniquet around their arms, go to town doing a bunch of curls, right? And they'll say, well, how does that work? They'll talk about metabolic stress and all this other stuff. Well, the mechanism is that the metabolic stress fatigues the muscle, forces it to recruit all those motor units in sooner, right? So you can use a lighter weight and get that, uh, that, uh, that motor unit recruitment, for example, or you can do fewer reps than you otherwise would need to to get the same amount of fatigue because you're accumulating all these metabolites that fatigue the muscle and it has to pull more motor units into contraction. So <clears throat> once you get over a certain threshold of intensity, as pulling a number out of my butt, 80% or higher, 80, 85% or higher, you are required to, your muscles have to pull all those motor units into action right away from the first rep. That's why 90% singles are challenging. They're not super fast, right? So you're getting all those motor units right away, but at the cost of a bunch of fatigue. As you, you, if you had to volume match the two scenarios, 85% 1RM to 70% 1RM, one is substantially more fatiguing, right? If you're gonna do enough volume to get an equivalent hypertrophy response. Does that kind of answer your question? The key is the recruitment, the mechanical tension on the muscle. Yeah, do you have anything to add to that? Oh. Okay. okay. The question is, what determines the back angle in the squat from oh, an anthropometric standpoint? Femur length, torso length, bar position, stance width, uh, and style. And how far you're allowing your knees to travel forward. Well, yeah. Just, well, but it's a function of everything. So, <laughs> maybe a better question would be, what doesn't determine uh, and back what point should you start thinking you're too low? That's a, now that's a really interesting question. So if we're under the guise or the, 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 uh, the suspicion that there's one type of squat model that is best, then you would say it, you're bending over too much if your knees aren't forward enough to recruit the optimal amount of mo muscle mass to move the most weight on the squat. I don't think that's real. The, so, people squat with different styles. That doesn't mean that just because someone always does it one way means that we shouldn't change it because we think that they could do it better another way. But it's something, it's trial and error. There are people who squat with the bar in the low bar position very vertically. They make their knees go very far forward to stay vertical. And that's a style that works for them. There are other people who bend over a lot at the you know, bottom of the squat, and that works well for them. Now, those folks may, in fact, have shorter torsos, longer femurs, place the bar lower on their back, okay? But they're also committing to a style where they bend over more rather than push their knees far enough forward and stay vertical or take a really wide stance and stay more vertical. So which is the right combination for you is going to take trial and error and also is going to be the type of squat or whatever movement, because this same line of thinking transfers to all other movements that's most repeatable, tolerable, so that you can train at a high enough volume and frequency and intensity that doesn't hurt you with this style, right? The bench press is the best example here. People will say, well, why don't you just bench with wide grip? It's got a shorter range of motion. Of course you do that. Well, what if you can't bench more than once a week like that, otherwise it hurts your shoulders? That's not enough volume to make you get better, right? So. Uh, as far as what determines how far you're going to bend over, it is, in fact, where the bar goes. If it goes lower on your back, you're going to bend over more on average. If you have a longer torso, you're going to be more vertical than someone with a shorter torso. If you have longer femurs, you're likely to be more horizontal than someone with shorter femurs. If you have a wider stance, you're likely to be more vertical than someone with a narrower stance. If you shove your knees way, way forward, you're likely to be more vertical than someone who doesn't. But, lots what, of, lots of moving pieces. but what combination is right for you is going to depend on which one allows you to squat very consistently, regularly, without you know, pain you know, that crops up when the volume gets high, and that there are the least amount of technical errors that routinely occur. The question has to do with this. He has tennis elbow. So he has lateral epicondylitis or tennis, tennis elbow. But if you don't play tennis, is it tennis elbow? Is it squatter's elbow? Well, yeah. Deadlift? So, so, dead, so dead lift thumb? He 
he mentioned that the issue is that he feels it in all of the lifts. Tennis elbow or this sort of pain is super, super common. Uh, we see it and hear about it all the time. People come on our forums and complain to us about it all the time. So, so you have a tendinopathy at the elbow. And <clears throat> management of tendinopathy is kind of complicated. It, tendinopathies can be a huge pain and they can take quite a while to get better. But when people come to us with their elbow issues, oftentimes we can trace them back to the way they're squatting frequently. It, it seems to be exacerbated by certain ways of do, executing the low bar squat in particular. Uh, it would be pretty uncommon for someone to get an extensor tendinopathy from a deadlift, for example, even though you feel it in the deadlift because you're making a fist, right? And so when you make a fist, you're using the finger flexors, which are the muscles on this side of the arm, but when you squeeze anything real hard, you get some co-contraction of the antagonist on the other side. And that contraction, tension, tendons that are tendinopathic, that tension get uncomfortable. But oftentimes we can trace it back to the way people are setting up to squat, the way they're holding the bar, in the low bar position, for example. And so sometimes a lot of people are like, yeah, I set up to, I do my squats and it hurts, but I get through them and then I go to bench and I can't bench afterwards because it hurts too bad. And uh, it gets resensitized or re you know, irritated every time they go to squat. So if, if, if you are at all able to identify a particular thing that seems to uniquely make it the most sensitive, which I would guess is probably going to be the squat, because it's unlikely to come from the other lifts, then it oftentimes involves an adjustment of the squat, squat grip, the setup. We talk about this a lot in, in terms of making sure that the bar is loaded on your back and not in your arms. A lot of people tend to carry too much of the weight in their arms or on their hands have them try to unload as much of the weight off their hands and arms because when you're carrying it, it's all contracting and that kind of compression in the bottom of the, of the elbow here when it's carrying the bar uh, can seems to generate that tendinopathy a lot of the time. So if I can't get them to do that right, then I just have high bar for a while and stuff starts to get better. If you were to go see a sports medicine person for this, they would diagnose it immediately because you just described the classic test for it, just raising your middle finger against resistance it reproduces it, that's diagnostic pretty much. Uh, they would offer you uh, physical therapy, which would involve a lot of like, you know, eccentric wrist curls and stuff like that. Oh, hell yeah. Suggestive injection yeah. to the epicondyl uh, area on the side, uh, and which don't really do anything. Um, and so, yeah, the solution is to keep training, but the solution is to find the movements that sensitize it the most and try to modify them to get less of that sensitization and it should improve with time because the natural history of tennis elbow is to improve uh, hip on time. So, real quick, so there's a, uh, so to, to be at a certain toleration level of pain is no big deal. Well, <laughs> so, so yeah, when, when I have somebody who has any type of pain or tendinopathy in particular, if the pain gets worse and worse and worse right. as you work up in weight, work up in sets, then that's usually more of a reason to change training. Right. If you warm it up a little bit and it starts to feel better, which right. is pretty common with tendon that's issues, and yes, it gets better as you warm it up, then I say carry on. But if, you have, if you've identified the movement that really seems to piss it off, then modify that, right? And then it'll get better. Gotcha. Yeah. Rest also works wonders. Having had, uh, what does? Rest. Resting the, you know, not doing, not lifting for a week or two weeks. Yeah. yeah, I think the rest thing is probably a, like a, like the last ditch effort. Uh, the evidence overall on resting tendonitis is bad. Really? Yeah, I mean, but what are you going to do? Not tell your patient to rest, you know, if you only got 30 seconds left in the office visit? I mean, and honestly, it, it's just, look, we're not, yeah. most physicians are not well up on the pain science stuff, and, and further, they don't have the time to counsel. And, it's, and then the, last, the, the thing is, it's intuitive to say, just rest. But that's not, I would not recommend rest in these cases. I would recommend like Austin said, you find him something else that either pisses off, pisses it off less, or it makes it it doesn't get worse. If it's getting worse, I would agree with that particular movement maybe being contraindicated for a while, which does sound like that. Well, if it hurts, just don't do it. Yeah, but, that's a great doctor advice. But you're trying to find something similar that's tolerable that allows you to stay active and train. But I wouldn't take like a complete rest. Yeah, I wouldn't so, do that. So there's the pathophysiology or the way that tendinopathy manifests itself is pretty complicated. It has to do with a mostly non-inflammatory disorganization of the tendon tissue. And rest does not reverse that. Um, it may just make it so that you are not doing things to which you are sensitive, but it does not reverse the underlying pathophysiology of you know, the tendon tissue itself. And so when they look at research on, we talk about muscle protein synthesis all the time, 
stuff like collagen protein synthesis in the tendons, and they're remodeling the way your muscles remodel themselves, your bones remodel themselves, your skin regenerates, all this kind of stuff. Oh, really? uh, the enzymes that basically contribute to that cycle of regenerating your tendons, um, there's a fancy name called metallic, uh, matrix metalloproteinases. They are active in recycling, uh, basically uh, contributing to breakdown of tendon at really, really, really high workloads, which are the kinds that tend to produce tendinopathy, right? When you acutely just way overload the stress dose to your tendons and they start to go through this degeneration and you get tendinopathy. Uh, when you completely unload the tendons, those enzymes start doing their thing too. So patients who are basically bed bound in the hospital, they get tendinopathy without exercising because they're not doing anything, because tendons like loading, the same way muscles like loading, the same way bones like loading. So that is what guides our recommendations to find a way to remain active and keep training, because tendons respond to mechanical tension and loading. Uh, but you have to do it in a way that it is not sensitive to, yep. which is where the exercise amount of modification, volume, dose adjustment, all that kind of stuff comes into play. All right, so that ends part one of our Santa Cruz question and answer section. Part two is going to be posted next week. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe for all the latest content. Leave us a comment below as far as what you want to see next. We'll see you next time.